There is not one person, except for I guess Satoshi Nakamoto, that truly are anonymous on Earth. Do we even have privacy at this point? Bitcoin is the last stand for privacy. Do we actually have free speech? The dark web essentially was developed by the Navy as a means to provide their employees a way to whistleblow anonymously. They don't have to manage an ETF. They don't have to pick stocks. They don't have to find out which bond to buy this year, which portfolio to balance out and diversify. It's just Bitcoin. Owning scarce assets is the name of the fiat game. You were the first guy that ever interviewed me. <laughs> like you were one of the first that, like when I came up a little bit on Twitter, that like uh, prompted me on on, a, on an interview, which was amazing uh, for me to see. This was one of the f points where like, oh, it inspired me to do more and more and more. So I'm really looking forward to the interview and talking with you today. And uh, this is basically uh, how we came here today. Uh, and the question that I wanted to ask, uh, start you with, with the question is, how did this all start for you, the Satoshi's Journal? Like how, why did you get motivated to, to start something? Yeah, thank you for the kind words and appreciate all of your content. And um, you're doing great things with this podcast, so keep it up. And I believe you even wrote an article for us a while back. And so uh, I started Satoshi's Journal as a means to be able to have uh, medium by which all writers can write Bitcoin only content, uh, whether it's their Bitcoin story or whether it's a technical uh, Bitcoin article, anything Bitcoin, uh, even if it's fantasy, fictional, nonfiction, anything in that regard, Bitcoin only. We will publish, and prior to B Satoshi's journal, I was writing for Bitcoin magazine. I wrote, I think, a little over eight articles for them. And um, the inspiration of Satoshi Journal actually came from my angst against being uh, censored in a couple of my articles by Bitcoin Magazine. And um, I, I appreciate what Bitcoin Magazine is doing. Um, I think they're, they're doing great things. There's some things I don't agree with. And one of the biggest things I didn't agree with was the fact that, quote, my articles were the way I submitted them. They were returned back to me. I didn't even recognize them. And one of them just, I was told it wasn't long enough. It was like 550 words and it was supposed to be a minimum of 600. And I was like, what the hell? So those two things really bothered me. And um, so I just said, well, I mean, I can start something um, similar. I love writing. That's my passion. Um, and so I started Satoshi Journal. And we focus on Bitcoin stories. We love to get people's stories. Right now we have a bounty out for people's stories if they want to write a story. You can write it and uh, poss possibly be rewarded 100,000 sats. Um, so we tr that's the other thing. Um, no one gets paid. As far as the people that are on the payroll at, at Bitcoin Magazine, the people that submit articles to Bitcoin Magazine don't get paid. And so I thought to myself, this that's not good. I mean, why shouldn't you be, incent be uh, incentivized to write um, or paid, be paid? And so we have that feature. If you write for us, you can get tipped for your article. Um, for a while there, I was giving Satoshis out for people's articles. And it was good, but um, it's not a good business model. So I started resorting to the tips deal. And so it's basically proof of work. If your article is good and it resonates with somebody, then in your in your wallet, you might have some tips. Um, so I think I've, that's pretty much it as far as how Satoshi Journal was incepted. And it's my passion to continue to write as much as possible and provide good content. And also we do news. And I, I don't, I'm not, a, we're not a big media company, not, not a big publication company by any means. But my goal was to just be raw, uncensored, unfiltered, and just no different than, than Bitcoin. Just have the Bitcoin ethos. So I, I try to post and repost things that are not necessarily posted by the big Company like um, Bitcoin News, Bitcoin Magazine, all the big ones. I'm trying to do things different, and I focus on the plebs. Anything that's newsworthy from the pleb world, and anything that's newsworthy in areas that aren't being covered by those big media companies, i.e., stories in Africa. I have a lot of friends, Bitcoin friends in Africa, so I, I know about what's happening in Africa more so than the big companies because I'm so nimble that I can talk with people, and, and so if I find out that there's a a a meetup in Zimbabwe or a meetup in Malawi, I repost it. 
and that's that's my niche i guess so that will be my answer there robin i i love it and i also love that you are um talking about censorship and this is something that uh keeps me up every day a little bit because it's like uh oh when when youtube decides to to censor me then my my whole living right now is kind of gone because most of it comes from from youtube and the podcast and the podcast is mostly uh, watched on youtube um of course there's also the podcast platforms like spotify and stuff like that but this is a little bit sm smaller for me uh then of course there's also twitter uh but most people don't watch long form there how do you see the current state of, of social media? Are you, um, is it now better than like 10, 15 years when we only had the, the, the big media houses and now we at least have like platforms where we can put out stuff? Of course, there is shadow banning, there's censorship, uh, but at least like there's a possibility and there's Nostra and, and you can still like have your own website and blog. Uh, and you really have to do something completely wrong that they uh, <laughs> get off your domain and stuff like that. Like uh, usually uh, people don't get to that length. Um, how do you see the current state of like censorship? Uh, and like, for example, for, for Bitcoin magazine, for the magazine, for me, it's like fair game because it's their magazine. Uh, people can publish something like it's a private thing. Uh, you can disagree or agree, but it's like their thing. Do do we have the the possibility right now with all the social medias going on, with Nostra going on, do we actually have like free speech and and uh, possibility to say things, or uh, what would you improve? Yeah, I think now more so than the past, we do have the possibility to achieve what you just expressed. Um, and the hard thing with today is we have too much um, outlets, and so you have to do more verification. Um, I mean, you, you should always verify and not trust, but it's when you have so many media outlets and you don't know what to believe, and then you compound that with AI, it's going to be a behoove us humans to just do even more verification of what we're reading before we repost or before we say, oh, this is the truth. And, and the thing that's good today that we didn't have before is the means by which we can for instance, your podcast, if you are on YouTube, you can back it up on Rumble or you can back it up on another platform that if YouTube decides to take you off, at least you have another copy of your video. And But interestingly enough, like I remember Jason Lowry, his TED Talk, I couldn't find it for the longest time on YouTube. And it's a very good one. And But I found it on, on Rumble. Um, and I think it came back on YouTube, but I believe they took it off. Um, but they take off a lot of people. Um, so, and then Nostra is another thing that it's just hasn't been popular, made popular yet. But if you want to basically have the means by which all your social media posts and activity cannot be censored, then that's another medium. So it just takes time for humans to research what means they have to be able to uh, prevent censorship and to maximally use those means. Um, quite honestly, Robin, I think Bitcoiners are probably the most, the people that care about their privacy and censorship resistance most than, than anybody. Uh, sad to say, and I hate to generalize, but I, I think most people are just haphazard with their um, privacy and identity and all that um if we've got to the point where when you download an app on your, your 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 cell phone there's a big page that comes up that says if you agree or disagree to the stipulations i mean you have to agree if you want to use the app i mean there's no and so like because of that becoming so commonplace and just clicking agree we've lost almost all of our privacy when it's all said and done um so we have to keep we have to protect the last, the last wisps, wisps of privacy that we still have, um, and at, at least we do now have the means by which we can do that with certain things like I've already said, Rumble and Noster. So that would be my answer be my there. Answer. Sorry. Are you afraid that we have at some point uh, privacy just just not there yet because people 
uh, I hear it so many times from from like my mom, for example, who's like, "Oh, I don't have anything to hide," and I'm like, "Yes, but you still should not share everything, and you still should uh, care about your privacy." Uh, but I feel like more and more people, especially the, the younger folks, they are sharing everything, and then we have the the thing where we like, and we talked about that in the in the last episode also. Uh, when you are in a public place, you're going through a city. It's like maybe Vienna, Prague, a big city. You're going through there every day, and there are tourists p- taking pictures of on how many smartphones are you on the uh, on, on the camera roll because someone clicked a picture of some f- something and you are on there. Then everything is backed up to the iCloud, and the iCloud has AI programs running over them. Like you are maintained <laughs> by, by a lot of systems. Um, do, do we even have privacy at this point? Uh, and I, I mean, sorry, Robin, I, I believe that the last privacy we have is Bitcoin. I, I think, and people disagree with me on this, a lot of Bitcoiners, my father-in-law, but what was proof in the pudding for me was this, you just got to ask yourself, who has your social security number? or whatever number your local jurisdiction has. They they already know everything about you with your social security number. Who who has your driver's license? The state, the government. They already know everything about you. When you get a job, what, what do you have to give them? All your private information. When you have a bank, what do you have to give them? All your private information. There is not one person, except for, I guess, Satoshi Nakamoto and some other um, cypherpunks, um, shadowy supercoders that truly are anonymous on Earth, because you can't be. Um, unless you're a little hermit in an undisclosed little mountaintop hiding in a tree. Bitcoin is, I think, the last stand for privacy. That's the reason that I- I'm very thankful there's smarter people than I working on trying to get Bitcoin to be more private. Um, and, I, and I say private, 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 there's nothing private about Bitcoin because it's an open ledger. But what I mean is, at a minimum, one should be trying to manage their UTXO set. Basically, Bitcoin is a UTXO, unspent transactional output. Instead of basically having all your Bitcoin in one UTXO, the closest thing to keeping that Bitcoin private and 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 someone not being able to look at the blockchain and say, oh, this is Jeremy or this is Robin, is to have all your UTXOs managed and divvied up. And that's something that I wish I would have done a better job when I started. Um, so I, I kind of think, oh, and so what really made me, outside of what, what I just said, when I learned about the, the dark web, which is Tor, um, the dark web gets a lot of bad rap, but the dark web essentially is was developed by the Navy as a means to provide their employees a way to whistleblow anonymously. That was the how the dark web was incepted, Tor. Uh, forget uh, something onion router. The dark web was created for that, but guess who got a hold of it? Criminals. And what do criminals do with a tool that was meant to be something that was just going to allow someone to retain an anonymity um, if they were to whistleblow? They're going to use it for criminal acts, and that's what that's why the dark web gets so much uh, flack. The dark web has a lot of bad stuff that happens on it, but the dark web allows someone in China or India where they have their internet firewall to be able to talk with people that are in another country. If they didn't have the dark web, the t- tour, they won't be able to do that. So, and then I learned more about it. I mean, on, on tour, you literally, you can go on there just like eBay and buy people's identity. You can find their driver's license. You can find, I, I truthed all this because when I found out about it, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe you can buy drugs and guns and uh identities i was like nah, that's a bunch of crap so before i did any of it of course you're scared to do it I went on youtube and i searched how to do it and lo and behold indeed you can find people's identity just and, and you can bid on it this is nothing crazy it's maybe taboo to talk about but you now know that the dark web was created for something that was good and they used it for bad um we had the silk road everyone knows about the silk road as soon as the FBI shut down Silk Road, guess what happened? I think within weeks, Silk Road 2 came up. That showed you that the FBI didn't have any control over the dark web. That's why they hate it. That's why the government doesn't want Bitcoin. 
you can't control what is uncontrollable and uh bitcoin is not controllable and that's why that's why it's a very powerful thing but it's important that because bitcoin is such a transparent open ledger that you at least at a minimum especially now that we're going through these crazy privacy uh issues and um the government cracking down on people when you buy your bitcoin and when you store it um there's rules of thumb that you have a uh a UTXO that's a UTXO set that's no more than a million that's so when you're managing your UTXO set if you have 10 million sats the the ideal way to store those sats is to have 10 1 million UTXO sets and and this was something that was just recommended um by one of our friends on Twitter uh, wicked he's, he's a well known gentleman um, does some awesome graphical work and and security work and Bitcoin work, and and it's instead of having one 10 million UTXO set, and and then and having 10 1 U million UTXO sets, that means that the likelihood of the government or somebody that wants to find you finding you with 10 UTXO sets and getting those back to you, it's it's we'll just say 10 times harder. Whereas if you have one UTXO of 10 million UTXOs, they can say, oh, we're, this one person has this one big UTXO set. Additionally, those UTXO sets should be associated with one Bitcoin wallet, or, uh, sorry, with uh, multiple Bitcoin wallets. So that's why they always preach in the Bitcoin world that when you buy your Bitcoin and you transfer it to a wallet, you always create a new wallet address. So those things are hand in hand for you to be able to retain privacy on an open ledger that everyone can see and then you go to the notion of how how secretive do you want to be i mean what do you have to hide and like what your mom said my father-in-law said the same thing um i mean in one respect what do you have to hide i mean i mean if it, it, it comes down to this if you have a lot of bitcoin and you don't want to be found out for how much Bitcoin you have for whatever reason, then manage your UTXOs and use a different wallet address every time you make a transaction. And I'm very positive that there's very, very, very tiny fraction amount of the world in Bitcoin that even does that. I think it would be the maxis of the maxi that do it. So I don't know what a percentage that'd be, but when it's all said and done, Robin, I think the vast majority of people are going to use Bitcoin in the least private way possible by not doing what I just said. So that goes back to your question. I mean, is there any privacy? There's not much. I mean, I don't know how much, but there's not much. The government knows everything about you. So unless, like I said, you're a shadowy super quarter, Satoshi Nakamoto or Hermit in the Hill, uh, you're, you're SOL. So even even the maxis that are shadowy super quarters on on Twitter, in their in their local jurisdiction, they they're known by the government. And we lost majority of of our privacy in two thousand and was it two thousand and nine, September twenty eleven that those towers were taken down. What happened thereafter was um, the government instituted. It was a program that allowed them to basically get all of our information that they didn't already have. Um, I'm sorry. I'm, something came out of the 9-11 um, terrorist attacks that allowed them to even get more information. And they're still going to try to get more information. So they're already trying to do it with Bitcoin. They're trying to censor Bitcoin in every way possible. They're making Bitcoiners scared. Bitcoiners in America, anyway, they're moving to other countries. They see the writing on the wall. And um, that's a long, drawn-out question and answer, so sorry, but that would be my answer, I guess, Robin. And I have for everyone, uh, uh, because Wicked, as you mentioned him, we actually had two or three weeks ago a show with him on this podcast, uh, and we went 
in this topic, you take soil management really deep. So for everybody that's uh, uh, really like interested, uh, maybe I think I think and, and link it in the video, but uh, I might forget it. So like just go on my channel and, and search Wicked uh, or you take soil management. It's the only one with you take soil management that, that I did. And he did a really great job uh, in explaining the balancing between privacy and avoiding dust because the other aspect of UTXO management if you have a lot of small UTXOs and the fees are getting really high in like 10 20 years and you did not consolidate them um, is they um, they might be unspendable uh, because the fees are higher than the actual Bitcoin stack so there's this privacy aspect to it and there's this dust aspect to it and he did an amazing job in like one hour or something to explain what's going on, what you can do, what tools to use and stuff like that. So uh, for everyone, I recommend watching this to the end and then <laughs> going to the UTXO uh, thing. Yeah, and he he's the one that caused me to, I had the t intent to move from my ledger wallet to a cold card, but he's the one that taught me how to do that with his amazing tutorial. And also, he helped me with my UTXO management because of his videos. I highly recommend that everyone watches all his videos because he's very technical. He, they're very long videos because they're very uh, detailed. And he goes step by step by step. So I have utmost respect for that gentleman. I've got to meet him. He's an amazing individual. And um, I just, I can't tell people enough. Please go to his videos. Manage your UTXOs appropriately. And also, if you have a ledger, transfer from ledger to cold wallet or cold card, sorry, or whatever wallet outside of ledger, because ledger is not a good deal. Um, so, yeah, thank you for telling me about your interview. I, I think I had remember uh, reading about it as far as you, I think, announcing it. And I think I even retweeted your tweet. If that, I think it was him, actually. Yeah, Vicky did a great job and it was well received. I got uh, two kinds of comments, like uh, the first one was great that you talk about it and great that I finally understand it and take it serious. And the other was like, it was too technical. So I feel like I, I have to do a second one where I like even step out a, even a little bit more. Uh, but I feel like that's that's an actually a, a good thing. And I got also like the comment uh, that someone like watched it two times and the second time they actually understood it. Uh, because it's just a, it, it's not an easy topic if you never thought of that. Like it's Bitcoin itself is something completely new. And we can after that talk about the Bitcoin revolution and how it's generational wealth. But it's 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 a dif difficult uh, uh, topic. And then the technical stuff on top of that. Yeah, what to do? The easiest way for me to understand UTXOs and the management thereof was how another person, his name is TC. Everyone knows him on Twitter. If you don't follow him, follow him. Uh, meditation underscore man, I think, is his, his Twitter handle. Mm -hmm. When you have a wallet, just a wallet, a physical one with dollars, you have dollars, you have $5 bills, you have $10 bills, you have $100 bills. Your UTXO set in Bitcoin is no different in that if you have, let's just say, one Satoshi is a dollar bill and five Satoshis is a five dollar bill and ten Satoshis is a ten dollar bill, so on and so forth. If you were to think about it the same way, do you want to carry a wallet full of a hundred dollar bills or do you want to carry a wallet that's a mix of one, ten, fives, twenties, and hundreds? When I was explained to me that way, I then understood the value of having um, Smaller UTXO sets, but not like a million UTX, not like a hundred million UTXOs, a hundred million, like, like a billion UTXOs. Uh, having smaller UTXOs, i.e. one million UTXO sets, subsets with separate wall addresses for each one, prepares one for the future when someone looks at all the open ledger of Bitcoin and says, oh, cool, there's all these small little transactions. There's this huge transaction. Let's look at that one. Oh, there's this even bigger transaction. Let's look at that one. They're less likely to look at those little small ones. And even if they do look at them, if you have a bunch of small ones, you have clouded your transactional identity by doing that. So I just wanted to share that because that's how I was able to like in my little farm brain down on the farm. I, that's how I say it down on the farm. That's how I understood it better. Uh, amazing. And 
Um, it's really important to to take UTXO management seriously, and and I say that because I know Bitcoiners aren't because of personal experience. I took uh, UTXO management series just last year, end of last year, and I was already three years in Bitcoin. I was already two years all in in Bitcoin. Uh, I was already on Twitter actively uh, tweeting about it and screaming about it. I was uh, really active in the community and I was still not doing it. So uh, it's it, it, it's something that um, first only people that were concerned with the privacy did. Now a little bit more people do it because the fee debate is coming up and the dust debate is coming up. Uh, this was not a like five years ago, six, seven years ago, this was just not a not a thing that uh, Bitcoiners were concerned about, but slowly, slowly the concern comes up uh, and it's a valid concern. So we have to take it seriously. It's, it's, we are early adopters uh, and we have to do extra work. Like uh, when you come in Bitcoin in 20 years, there are probably really great solutions for that. You probably know about it or there's some technical thing uh, that makes it easier or it's like well known that there's, in 20 years it will be less of a problem because so many people already went through that hoop and all so many like people tested everything but we are still in a really early stage uh, which kind of brings me uh, even to my next question what, what do you think is like the current state of game theory when we see when we look at bitcoin um, and where we see where 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 we are uh, I'm a little bit confused with, are we in the stage where they still laugh at us? Are we in the stage where they keep fighting us? The ETF kind of is like, are they joining us even? <laughs> I'm, I like with, with that, I'm like uh, a little bit of all of the worlds because it's like ETF, they're joining us. But then I hear Jamie Diamond, Elizabeth Warren talking about, oh, they are fighting us. Uh, yeah, it's like, it feels like there's there's a lot going on. Do you have like uh, a plan where you're like, uh, where are we? Okay, yeah. So I'm going to give it down on the farm analogy. I, I have a farm. I have miniature goats and donkeys. My donkeys in the summer, they get a lot of flies around them. And when there's too many flies, they start hitting their face with their their tail. And when there's even more flies, they start, sometimes you see them running around trying to get rid of them or they start rolling around in the dust. The analogy is this, um, a donkey is a big animal and a fly is a little, little pest. And I think we're at the point, from a game theory standpoint, of the donkey is just hitting us with, hitting the flies, the Bitcoin, with his tail. Um, yes, they're fighting us, but that, remember that little fly that's pestering my donkey the donkey doesn't like it because the, the little fly is going over there and getting on his eyes and his mouth this and the other so he just simply just gets his all day you'll see his little tail go and slap the flies like he'll do it all day and, and it's interesting because i have two donkeys and if you if anyone that has a farm will, will understand this analogy donkeys or horses they'll they'll stand next to each other in such a manner where the butt end of one donkey is at the face of the other donkey. So they help each other uh, hit flies. That's kind of what's happening now is multiple government entities are asked to ass, or sorry, asked to head. The flies are hitting them, the Bitcoin, and the privacy, and the fact that we can send money across the world with no one being able to do anything about it. They don't like that. and the energy aspect they're just little at this point the flies are just bothering the government in their mouth in their head and, and, and their eyes and their and they're just different entities are just flicking their little tail to take the flies out the donkeys have not started running to get rid of the flies the donkeys have not started rolling around in the dust to get rid of the flies so i don't think they get to the point where they're truly fighting us that war has just begun and it's only going to get worse. And I also think that the government truly does not understand the implications of what we have in our grasps. A lot of people say government people are stupid. 
I worked for the government for over 15 years and there is a lot of stupid people, but that they're smart enough to know that something's awry and they're, something's starting to get at their power. My opinion, Robin, and I work in a place where we focus on energy. The thing that's going to upend and be the true Trojan horse of Bitcoin is the energy aspect. Even in the energy sector where I work, in the government, people still don't have a clue about Bitcoin. They, they refer to it as cryptocurrency generally. They, they, they do not understand the huge energy implications of Bitcoin. And that's actually what interests me more than anything in Bitcoin after I learned. Because energy equals MC squared. Energy is everything. Yes, the monetary aspects of Bitcoin are great, but the energy aspects, in my opinion, is greater. And that's what's going to catch all the people, all the politicians and the rural powers at, by surprise when going to your game theory question. When ExxonMobil announces finally that they're mining Bitcoin, which they already are, and when I forget, it was, I think it was Shell or Conoco or Someone, one of those companies, they sponsored Bitcoin Magazine's last conference. When the energy companies, because energy runs the whole world, when the first one announces that they're going on a mass scale and mining Bitcoin, they haven't been announcing it, in my opinion, because it gives the other companies a competitive advantage. But it is happening. And it's because the incentive of Bitcoin is such that the EPA will not shut down these oil fields as long as they're not emitting too much methane. Um, and if they are emitting too much methane, they have to shut off. And if you put a Bitcoin miner next to your oil field, each of your oil rigs, you don't ever have to shut off from making money Bitcoin and oil. It just doesn't make sense why no energy company would be not be mining Bitcoin. Because they all have to give off wasted gas, whether it's methane, natural gas, um, any other form of gas that they hit whenever they're mining or uh, drilling. So I think that's a huge aspect of game theory. Energy, I think, is going to be the main thing that pushes the Trojan horse into the citadel of the government, and they're just going to have to grasp it. And the beneficiaries of that are going to be the people in many, many different forms. The game theory, it's funny because it's happening now because of number go up, and it's always been number go up. The genius of the protocol, supply and demand, I've always equivocated it to a bug light. The bugs go to the the blue light because they're attracted to it. When the price is up, the blue light turns on, and they go to it. And when they get to the blue light, they, what happens? They get zapped. They die. <laughs> when the blue light's off, the price is going down. The bugs don't go. Right now, the, the blue light is on. The Bitcoin price is getting higher. And the bugs are going after it. The ETFs. Morgan Stanley. Bank of America. Uh, Wells Fargo. I think Bank of America. Yep. Um, this is huge, man. This is bigger than most people are thinking. I remember going to a bank in my local area. And I asked them, Do you guys, are you guys con contemplating um, offering selling Bitcoin here? And they just laughed at me. Wells Fargo, I believe, is the third largest bank, and they're basically buying Bitcoin. Um, and so the the little bugs are going to the blue light, the price of Bitcoin that's going up. And there's going to be more bugs and bigger bugs. And uh, But as soon as that light goes off, as soon as the Bitcoin price reaches its next all-time high, there's no more bugs. So then well, it's just another long bear cycle and it continues so it's a beautiful protocol on how it was designed but it's the greed of man that's feeding bitcoin and and i hate to say it that way but someone and i think you i think it was nico with simply bitcoin he said bitcoin um reigns in the greed of man or something he put it much better than i but right now, the greed of man is not reined in because anyone can print, the government can print as much fiat currency as they want. Um, oh, that's what it was. Bitcoin domesticates human greed.
And that, that was a very powerful statement when I heard it. Um, there is no domestication of our fiat monetary system. It's, it's, it's always been ruled by the powerful and they will continue to have all the power, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, until we have a money that's an equal playing field for everybody. So I love game theory. I've written two articles on it, and no one knows the final outcome. One thing I will, I should have started off with this, but game theory can be defined simply as this. If you're playing a game, any game, but in this case we'll say a game of us chess. When I move my little pawn forwards, and Robin, you decide to move your bishop the other way, you are making moves to counteract me and vice versa with the ultimate outcome of I need to have better moves so as to checkmate you and win. The beauty about Bitcoin is it's not playing. It's not even, it's in the game, but it's not in the game. It's all the players, the banks, the ETFs, they're the ones that are playing in the game. And it's almost like Bitcoin just watching <laughs> play its game. So, in, in, but in a nutshell, Bitcoin will checkmate. And in my opinion, there's no stalemate. There's no option for a stalemate. In, in the game of chess, if two players get to a point in the game where they, no one can move, that's a stalemate. In the game of chess that Bitcoin's playing with the world, there's going to be a checkmate. Uh, that's my opinion on it. In the game of chess, there are 1 times 10 to the 18 possible moves. Um, that's a lot. 1 times 10 to the 12 is 1 trillion. 1 times 10 to the 40, what I, what I think I said, 1 times 10 to the 42. Sorry, I misspoke earlier. I think it's 1 times 10 to the 42. Is how many moves that are possible in the game of chess. In the game of chess that Bitcoin's playing, because it would be considered 3D, 4D, 5D chess, no one knows how many like moves. And that's what makes... I can write an infinite amount of, of, of articles on game theory and never run out infinity. So that's why I love Bitcoin's game theory is because it just keeps you guessing. So all I say is just get your popcorn and your Coke and watch it because it's fun and it's amazing and it's beautiful. And, and we're seeing a money basically monetized before our very eyes. No one got to see the monetization of gold. Over 2,000 years ago, no one got to see when gold was at a penny or a dollar or a hundred. No one. And we're seeing Bitcoin monetize over the last 15 years. That, that's a beautiful thing. No one. That's why we're very lucky to live in this time. We're actually getting to see a money go from being a baby to being 15 years old. And, and it's, it's, so you would think it's a teen year. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin. Or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing. How to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. That's, uh, that was amazing. And when we think of game theory and when you think of the, the bigger revolution that's going on with, with Bitcoin, I find it's amazing that it's the first revolution that we ever had 
that when you are participating now in the revolution against the current system, which we had a lot of times in history, but it's the first time ever where you're actually gaining financial power, where you're actually uh, gaining um, resources from that. Usually when you have a, a revolution, you're standing up against the system, you have to suffer a lot. You have to uh, pay a lot to participating in the revolution. You also have to pay to participate in this revolution, but it pays off over time. If you're long term in the Bitcoin, uh, you're actually gaining resources, you're actually gaining uh, financial uh, financial stability, and you're actually gaining even freedom uh, rights, uh, not only at the end of the fight, usually like freedom revolutions, re revolution is in the, in the end of the game, then, then all of a sudden you're gaining it. But even before uh, Bitcoin checkmates the system, when you are participating in that uh, revolution, you are getting uh, more free and more powerful and more resourceful with time. And that's a an, 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 an really interesting and powerful thought uh, that, that Bitcoin enables you. And which also leads me to my, my next question. Um, is, is Bitcoin completely changing retirement planning? I feel like when, when I think of my retirement, it's like, yeah, I have Bitcoin. I, I, I don't care for anything else. Uh, my, my parents, other people, even from, from my generation, they're like, oh, yeah, I have this uh, in America. They're like 401ks. I'm not in America. We have like pension systems where you have to pay in. You have private insurance. Like There are so many different things you can do. And I'm like, yes, I have Bitcoin. <laughs> that, that, that's, my, that's my retirement plan. Yeah, to answer your question short, yes, Bitcoin is changing retirement as we know it. And I want to kill a lot of sacred cows with what I'm about to say. And a lot of those cows were actually killed by a book that I highly recommend that's called Killing Sacred Cows. Now, there's other, a lot of books that I read that have killed the sacred cows of retirement planning, financial planning, as, as we know it. And I'm going to go through them as fast as possible. But <clears throat> you are the best person to manage your money, uh, unbeknownst to yourself, maybe. Just in general, not, I'm not talking to you, just in general. And the reason is because you care most about your money. But the vast majority of people give their money to a financial planner. That financial planner is supposed to care. They're supposed to be a financial fiduciary. That's what their name is. But there's also an incentive that they basically value a product of which they get a kickback. So it's skewed that the financial fiduciary is incentivized to be a steward of your money, but they're making money off of it. I went down this rabbit hole a long time ago to find out, and I, inter I interviewed financial planners just to see what they do for, a, for me, for my dad, my mom. And it's so easy a monkey could do it. That's what I come down to it. Um, and it's even easier now with Bitcoin. And the reason why it's so easy with Bitcoin is sometimes the easiest thing is the hardest thing to do. I don't understand. And and there's some means to be able to understand this. But if I were to tell you just to simply buy Bitcoin and save, and that will get you to early retirement before anything, you're not going to believe me. I mean, not you, but just people in general. But that's how easy it is. Like, I mean, just save and hold it forever and that's it the, the 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 financial world is much like our fiat monetary system it's so convoluted with craziness and um monikers that people don't understand vert like monikers or words or they they try to make the game sound much more complicated than it is purposely so that you don't know how to play the game but the game is so simple. The game has always been, before Bitcoin, to accrue scarce assets, real estate, gold, silver, water rights, animals, tractor. Um, but if, if you play the game of Monopoly, and how many people realize this, the game of Monopoly is the game that you're currently playing in your real life right now. In the game of Monopoly, the strategy it blatantly says in there is that you accrue all the assets and bankrupt all the other players and guess what 
In the game of Monopoly, the bank, per the rule set, can create more Monopoly money if the bank runs out of Monopoly money. And it blatantly says that when it gets to the point when they run out of Monopoly money in the game, you can get a piece of paper and write new money on it. That is no different than the game that you're playing now. So if you can win the game of Monopoly that you play with your family at Thanksgiving or Christmas, you can win the game. That was before Bitcoin. That's how you win the game. That's how you retire early. That's how you attain financial freedom is know how to play the game of Monopoly and accrue all the assets and screw everyone else. They're going to go bankrupt. If you don't believe me, people listening, play the game of Monopoly and then start thinking about your life. Start thinking, why are the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer? It's because of the game of Monopoly. You might think that you're playing that game and you're having a good time with your family and yeah, you won. I, you have all the hotels, you have all the houses, you're getting all the rental income, you own all the best properties. And your family members who are also having a good time with you, they don't win the game because they don't have what you have in the game of Monopoly. That game is exactly the game you're playing. And it's for this reason that I'm trying to do Satoshi Journal because we do we do uh, Bitcoin education products. We have a card game um, and a children's book. Right now, I'm reverse engineering the game of Monopoly so that we can play the game in such a manner where the strategy is not to accrue all the asset. The strategy is to accrue as much Bitcoin as possible. There's The notion of saving is no longer in our vocabulary anywhere in the world. And it's because all currencies in the world are debasing faster than you can save. Why would you save? And the people that understand that better than Americans are Africans, Argentinians, Chileans. The U.S. is still very dumb and i say that with all due respect but whenever your inflation rate is not 20 or 30 percent and it's maybe 10 or 20 percent i mean i know it's higher than 10 percent uh in real terms but everyone thinks it's two percent so retirement and financial freedom are as easy as just saving in bitcoin and holding it and never selling it now, to go further into the retirement, actually, I'll stop there and then uh, I can go further, but uh, I'll let you go. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's really interesting for me because when you think about Bitcoin, the most effective um, strategy is just getting it and holding it, as you mentioned. But that's the hardest thing to do for people because they always want to do stuff. They, they don't want to leave it. They, they, they like, oh, but what do I do? Uh, what do I like? Yes. Set it up nicely, get a nice cold storage, self custody solution. Um, learn how to do it. Uh, try to like, uh, do, uh, uh, health checks every now and then from your self custody solution, like really dig deep. You need a lot of setup in time, but once you got everything set up, everything is perfect in your solution. You know where to buy, you know how to store it, you know everything. Then you just have to create value for other human beings. So in order for you to get rewarded in Bitcoin, and then you can store the Bitcoin in your uh, self custody solution. And uh, like you can pay your bill and what you don't need, you can put in in your Bitcoin savings account. That's it. Do that for the next 10 years and you will be a very, very wealthy uh, man be, or woman uh, be, because uh, Bitcoin will accrue even if you're just saving 50 or or $100 every month. It will accrue a lot of wealth because we are so early in the game. It's not only that Bitcoin itself, even if it's at full adoption, accrues value over time, but we are also having the adoption coming in like the sound money properties uh, uh, make it uh, go up in, in, in purchasing power. But then we also have the uh, adoption uh, uh, factor coming in. And that's, it's, it's fascinating to see uh, that, that game theory and that revolution playing out. And uh, yeah, it's, Bitcoin is a an, an fascinating savings device, but people have to get that. They don't have to manage an ETF. They don't have to pick stocks. They, they don't have to find out which bond to buy this year, which, which 
portfolio uh, to balance out and diversify and all that crap that <laughs> we have in the financial system uh it's it's just bitcoin <laughs> honestly so it's 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 very uh, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, uh thing for me yeah and and i wrote an article for bitcoin magazine called um bitcoin retirement generational wealth planning and if you want to see the numbers the math it's very simple to do on your own. I'll go through one example right now is, is and you don't need a lot of Bitcoin. I mean, at the time I wrote this, Bitcoin was, um, let's see what it was worth. Bitcoin was worth 60, 68,000 a coin. So that was when we were starting to go back down. Well, this was written in um, 2021, but I was trying to, Tell people the importance of just having 0.001 Bitcoin, which is the time of $68, 0.01 Bitcoin, $680, or one Bitcoin. But I emphasized on the 0.01 and the 0.001 Bitcoin. To prove the point, you don't have to have one full Bitcoin. That's great if you can get there. But additionally to having 0.01 Bitcoin, you've got to keep on saving in Bitcoin. So in one example, if a person started off with $680 of Bitcoin, which at the time was 0 0.01 of a Bitcoin, and they were able to save $5,200 a, a, a year, which is about $100 a week, over 30 years at, an, at, at a compound annual growth rate of 25%, they have $21 million. I mean, I started investing in my retirement at 21. Um, this number is not a pie in the sky number this is very achievable um and i would say it's actually very conservative i wrote the article to be very conservative purposely so if you go to um money chimp compound interest calculator what the the argument is that bitcoin doesn't accrue interest and and that's true the, the notion of getting interest on your bitcoin is is not what you want we're talking about the compound annual growth rate. If you use the compound interest calculator, it'll give you the same result as a compound annual growth rate. So just remember that you don't need to earn interest on your Bitcoin, that's stupid, because Bitcoin is already accruing, or sorry, already growing at a rate of 100% or more a year. So if you wanna know how much Bitcoin you'll have uh, in fiat terms, which I'm trying to, I've been trying to change that mentality. The most, most, more amount of Bitcoin you have is basically, that's the number you want to know, just how much Bitcoin you have. But if you do want to know how much your Bitcoin will be worth in the future, um, you can use a compound interest calculator. And in this case, you put your current amount of Bitcoin, the, the fiat amount, you put the uh, amount that you want to save annually, the years that you want it to grow, and the compound annual growth rate. And... That's how you'll be able to find out how much your Bitcoin will be worth. Understanding that it, it doesn't compensate for inflation. So when it's all said and done, be your own financial advisor. Manage your own money because you care about it the most. Save in Bitcoin. And if if I can't convince someone to save in Bitcoin because it's it's, it's hard. It's, 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 there's a lot of falsities out there still. Someone's just not going to start saving in Bitcoin. At a minimum, I tell them that they should save in gold and silver. And I know I'll get a lot of flack from Bitcoiners in that regard. But owning scarce assets is the name of the fiat game. And prior to Bitcoin, I was, I was buying real estate, apartments and houses, and gold and silver and water rights. And that was my means to win the game of Monopoly. I no longer have to be a rent seeker because that is rent seeking behavior. I just save. My mom always taught me, save for a rainy day. Um, and I've since learned that I need to save, but I need to save in things that are not inflating. Um, and, and it's, I'll say something else that's taboo. You do need to have some savings in cash. But for instances where you have an emergency, and that's what I do, you have a little bit of cash, Bitcoin, I have gold, I have silver. I still have things. I, I don't, I'm not balls to the wall Bitcoin. Relatively speaking, I am. But um, there's no problem with having a little bit of 
other scarce assets and um, a little bit of cash because if you look up the metrics for Americans, I believe it's about over 75% of Americans cannot afford a $400 um, expense that just comes randomly. And that, that says you, that tells you everything you need to know. People do not have savings. So, matter of fact, people have just mimicked their federal governments in the fact that they just accumulate more and more debt. They, they basically are monkey see, monkey do. The vast majority of the United States and all over the world, is monkey see, monkey do. Some countries better than others. Uh, Japanese are known for being savers, the Chinese. But everyone else, are de they're debtors. They have credit card debt. They have exorbitant debt. The simple thing is, as Bakingo says, that he's a well-known Twitter guy, stay solvent. What does that mean? Stay solvent means that when you get in a pickle, if a debt collector comes to you and says, hey, I need 10000 If you can't pay, you're not solvent. You need to have more income than you have expenses. That's basically the definition of being solvent. You, you need to be able, when someone comes to you and says, hey, give me my money, you have to give them your money. And you can't give them their money in the form of getting a loan to pay them. That means you're not solvent. I'll stop there. Yeah, it's it's um it it's so underrated and uh everybody has his own uh, situation uh, if if you are like uh, like me I'm I still have a little cash always uh I actually also own gold uh but not because it has I I made the uh, intentional decision to buy it it's just like something I got gifted from a family member and it has emotional value to me but still I have it uh and for me I'm like 25, I have no kids, I have no family. Uh, I can like get tomorrow to zero and I'm fine. Like if, if I feel, if I lose everything, it's fine. But there are other people, uh, especially if they have family, if they have a big company, if they have responsibility to, to pay someone the, the, the next few months, uh, it's a different situation. And uh, you might want to consider to actually have even feared uh, savings, feared uh, cash, Uh, laying around for the next few months uh, and you should never come in that like just prevent the situation that you have to sell your bitcoin uh, unless you live in el salvador and you can easily spend your bitcoin and you easily can just use your bitcoin without capital gains uh, implications tax implications stuff like that then like why not uh, full on bitcoin honestly uh, it's, it's 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 more more stable than fiat system especially when you're in el salvador um, but uh, it's so like if you are in a situation where you have tax implications when you sell bitcoin uh, and uh, you you want to consider okay what is wh what if my income falls out for the next three months Uh, uh, and there's like one, two, uh, unexpected, uh, invoices then come in. Can I handle that? And you should be able to handle that. And somebody might even con want to consider six months. Some might even want to consider one year, uh, and some are fine maybe with one month, uh, depending on the age, depending on, uh, what the living situation is. Uh, if, if they are father of like three, four of kids, then they need a lot more than if you are like 23 and a single guy and living in, in your mom's bedroom. Uh, it's like, uh, th there are different, um, situations in life. Uh, but, but I was ball steep in like a year ago. Uh, I'm still like hundred percent in there, but I have a little, Uh, 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 cash uh, buffer, and uh, with with my now I'm like independent. I'm not re relying on a job, so this also is like oh, I needed a little bit more cash reserves because there I have to pay taxes for stuff that I made in the past. Uh, there, there, there's like there's a lot of things going on in in uh, in my life where I'm like okay, let, now I have to be a little bit more responsible and have to a little bit more. Uh, unfortunately be involved with that fiat system which i don't like but it's still a thing that i have to do yeah and i think that the point should be made because we tend to get tunnel vision into including myself retirement planning and financial planning but more more importantly than all that planning is is self-planning um 
you can't eat your Bitcoin, you can't eat your gold, you can't eat your silver. You can't eat your water rights, you can't eat your 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 house. If shit were to go to shit, and I'm not being stoomed there, but if if we would get to a, a point, and, and it's, it, it's the reason why people don't think we'll get into this, is because we've never gone in it. They say that the people that last experienced a war, they're all dead. So the people that the new generation, they're going to be more pro-war because they've never been in a war to know that it's not a good thing. Uh, we've never been to a Great Depression. I don't see that as being far-fetched as happening. And so if it does happen, it's better to be prepared than not prepared. That's all I live. And so just remember, uh, everyone listening, that more so than money, um, Bitcoin, gold, silver, or currency, fiat currency, you, you need to have the knowledge to be able to figure out where your food comes from. Grow it yourself. If you know how to butcher an animal and eat it, those are all kind of long lost arts. Your community, know who lives next to you, maintain a relationship with you because when shit goes to shit, uh, when, when there is a calamity that happens, even if it's a small one, I mean, where I live, if if it snows one inch, everyone's crazed out because we don't get snow. And everyone, I kid you not, when there's a one inch or two inches, you'll see stores that have a bunch of stuff taken. Groceries, toilet paper, it's crazy. That's just a tiny, that's one inches of snow. What happened during COVID? That was a big thing. Guess what happened? Everything started disappearing from the stores. Um, so just be prepared monetarily, financially, this, that, and the other. That's important. But don't lose sight that you need to know, have a community built up, your knowledge that you have in your head to be able to help your neighbor in something that they can't, they don't know, and vice versa. And the ability to food and water, that's make sure that you know how to get your food and water. And um, like I said, I don't mean this to be doomsday. It's just, it, it happens. It's it's happening in the world today. There's people that actually, it behooves them to know how to butcher an animal and where fresh water is and how to get it more so than having money or currency. Um, it's just that in America and other countries, we're privileged. So Make sure that at least you're instilling in your brain. And Bitcoin does this. I mean, Bitcoin actually causes someone to want to become sustainable and resilient and, and, and not be able to be caught in a pickle. So for me, Bitcoin, and for everybody, it changes them. But for me, it's changed me in many different ways. I used to be a saver. I saved a lot. I'm a super saver now. And... I don't do real estate no more. Uh, I I try to be more co co cognizant of my health. Um, I've changed my diet a little bit. My religious aspect. I mean, I, I've never been. I've been religious, but now I'm not religious. I'm more of a agnostic theist. It, it's changed. It's caused me to actually question more than anything, everything. And I think that's what Bitcoin does. Once you start verifying and not trusting. You'll be the most quizzical, questioning person ever. And you'll question everything. Because once you find out that the monetary system is broken, and that comes as a surprise at first, and then you realize, oh shit, this is real. And Bitcoin is the exact opposite of our current monetary system. You'll start wondering, well, what else is a lie? What else is wrong? And that takes you, that's why there's the Bitcoin rabbit trail, rabbit hole, sorry. It will take you down so many holes you've never been. So. I can't emphasize more than anything, but verify, don't trust. I've been burnt many times for not doing that in my life. I've been more trusting than verifying. Verify and trust, and that simple action will cause you to question everything in the world that all the sheep and the cows that are just going with it, going with the flow. There's not many people that are that are going the other way that the herd's going. and and. When everyone's running that way, when you see one person running that way, you should stop and think. Because there's a saying that if everyone's thinking the same thing, no one's thinking. So just be a person that's thinking. Always use your critical thinking. And it's very important. I'll stop there. 
uh, I love it so much. And I have like written down as always like 20 more uh, topics and questions we can uh, get into, but uh, we are already over the, the one hour mark. Uh, and, and we, we should come to, a, to an end, but this is, it's like so many great things that I want to get in and we will cover it maybe in like a second round in like half a year or a year, uh, when we, when we do on the podcast, like a second round with some guests, uh, before we, uh, end, uh, we, we come to the end routine. I want to ask you one more question that I started asking all my guests. Uh, what are you currently uh, passionate about studying, learning, uh, doing whatever it is? which we did not touch on in the podcast, like which, which we did not cover till now. I have been thinking for a long time. Well, so first of all, I've been studying religions and world religions for a long time. I grew up in a Christian based family and I still practice the central tenets of Christianity, but I have questioned uh, over the last few years, religion in general. And I have ambitions of somehow, some way, Maybe starting a podcast on Bitcoin and religion, because those are my two passions. And religion has been my second passion, right along the line with Bitcoin. But I think that currently the only religiosity that's being put into Bitcoin is Christianity. There's a book, and it's a very good book. I highly recommend people read it, called Thank God for Bitcoin. But I think there's a niche and I think there's a lot of Bitcoiners that are in this niche, including myself, that are agnostic theists. That means basically that I believe in a creator, but I don't believe one thing. There is a creator, but I am accepting of all religions as far as their central tenets. Because if you start looking at those central tenets very closely, they all have similarities like you would never wonder or believe. Uh, there's hope, there's faith, there's love kindness the, the, the Hammurabi's code um you, you can read creation stories that are so similar to the bible story the stories that we have weaved over thousands and thousands of years my next journey or my journey that i've been on with bitcoin is to go down those stories and those and and just verify them not just oh trust God. So that'd be my, my next passion project. And um, I think it'll invigorate conversation amongst our Bitcoiners that are similar minded because it, it, I know that there are Christian Bitcoiners and that's fine. I know there's Jewish Bitcoiners, Muslim Bitcoiners, uh, Hindu Bitcoiners, but which one of them are right with their religion? And all signs that I'm looking at right now is no one knows and no one will ever know because you can't prove any of those without a doubt. But what can you prove? Bitcoin. And it's Bitcoin that has caused me to go and question all the religions of the world. And it's been amazing because when you look at it, a faith-based system, whether it's Hindu, Muslim, Christianity, it's faith-based. What does faith mean? Faith means believing in something you've never seen. Isn't that contrary to Bitcoin? So that's basically my next rabbit hole journey. I I'm already looking forward to that. Like I would love for, for you to start a podcast on that and, uh, and, and enjoying the shows in, in in that regard because it's it's uh, I think the religion topic already came up at least in 10 podcasts. And I also had Pastor Coin on, on my show who, who wrote the book and, and, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of great things that I already went in if, if, if the podcast, but I myself, I'm still like, uh, my opinion on religion is still not really, um, grounded. Like I already made a lot of uh, thoughts on that. Uh, I grew up Christian. Uh, I then came far away from Christianity and now I'm coming a little closer again. So like, uh, I, I simply did not did a deep dive. I also want to really read the Bible at one point, uh, and, and read the, those, those things, because I think it's important, uh, before you judge something that you actually, uh, dive deep into it. 
Uh, but yeah, it's it's a rabbit hole that uh, <laughs> I'm not not having the time to. Uh, but it it is a rabbit hole where I will go really deep on at some point, and I would love for you to have a podcast around that topic. Um, we have entered in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. It's kind of like the blockchain where the the blocks are connected to each other. Um, what lesson did you learn the hard way? And what changes did you make as a result of it? It's actually not not verifying and trusting. I, I'm I'm a very trusting person in general, and as I said before, it's burnt me, and it's burnt me multiple times recently. And, and I'm a bitcoiner, so I mean, shame on me. I committed a sin, but verify, don't trust, and that'll get you and save you your whole life. Um, so that would be the thing that I recently still working on. And um, it's hard to work on whenever you believe the best of everybody. Because I do, I believe everyone has the best intentions and are good people. But unfortunately, there's some sour apples and um, you got to be able to distinguish between the good apples and the sour apples. So verify, don't trust. And um, that would be my answer. Perfect, perfect, really cool. Um, where can people, before I let you go, before, uh, where can people find you? Where can people find more about you? Where can people, like, if they have ask, uh, questions uh, for you to ask, uh, is there, like, where can people get the best out of you? Yeah, if you go on Twitter, that's where I spend most of my time. Um, my Satoshi's journal handle is just, it's, that's how you spell Satoshi's journal at satoshi's journal that's on twitter my personal account is it's kind of hard to say it but at jeremican j-e-r-i-m-i-c-a-n 5445 um those would be the best places to see me i mean I, i've written for bitcoin magazine you just i think if you just search my name um back to privacy if you're going to find more about anybody it's going to be me and that's a function of who i work for so i can't I can't hide anything from who I work for. So if you just look at my name, you'll find me on Facebook, LinkedIn. I'm not hard to find. I'm not a shadowy super coder. So that'll be my answer. Yeah, the, uh, I did that today, actually, because uh, I know you under the guy that is Satoshi's journal. Uh, so the name Jeremy uh, Garcia was not something that was present in my head. And I saw uh, today's uh, calendar, like Jeremy Garcia, Jeremy Garcia. <laughs> who, yeah, who did I invite? Like, who's Jeremy Garcia? And I actually like Googled you, and then like, okay, uh, there was some weird uh, things coming up, like other Jeremy <laughs> Garcia, uh, and and then I was like Jeremy Garcia Bitcoin, and then there was uh, the profile of you coming up from from Bitcoin Magazine. Then I was like, okay, clicking on the Twitter link, and I'm like, ah, Satoshi's journal, and then I made the connection yeah. between the name and the. Uh, in Satoshi's journal because I already always knew the host of uh, Satoshi's journal, uh, but I did not connect the the name Jer Jeremy Garcia to it. Uh, so, but as uh, when when people want to Google you Jeremy Garcia and Bitcoin, then they find you one hundred percent. Uh, but I will also in the description uh, link everything uh, from you, like a Twitter handle or something like that. Uh, always put in some uh, guests' contact so they they can contact you uh uh in, in in the way that uh, makes sense and we talked about before and uh, may, maybe i started just now because you talked about and more and more guests bring it up like uh, like since the first podcast i did uh guests are bringing it up constantly i don't hear it that much like i i don't think like i'm 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 uh, uh, uh i'm sounding like arnold schwarzenegger <laughs> <laughs> but, but but guests are keep, keep mentioning it and uh, guests uh, saying uh, and even like uh, listeners and the comments to see it I, I should end the podcast with if i'll be back so uh, i i said I, i will end it uh, for today with i'll be back tomorrow <laughs> well awesome thanks for having me i appreciate it i had fun perfect then bye-bye bye-bye